General Motors president, E.M. Pete Estes. The program you're about to see tells an important story. It's a story of progress by General Motors and the automobile industry. This has been progress not only in providing transportation vehicles to meet the ever-changing needs of our society, but also in achieving major improvements in automotive safety, emissions, and fuel economy. Unfortunately, this is a story which uh, too often is misunderstood or ignored, and as a result, we've all had to bear the consequences of laws and regulations enacted by those who have not understood or refuse to accept the evidence of our accomplishments and our commitment to further progress. Among those consequences is a monumental financial burden on General Motors, on our dealers, you are dealers, on our customers, and in the end, on the entire nation. According to one non-GM estimate, government regulation of business will cost the nation a hundred billion dollars this year. At General Motors, the cost of federal, state, and local regulation since 1975 has averaged more than a billion dollars per year. And that's in addition to the cost of the hardware that we've had to add to our vehicles. It also has required the full-time efforts of an equivalent, believe it or not, of 24,000 of our most able employees. The cost to our customers also has been significant. Government regulations have added $145 to the price of a typical automobile in the 1980 model year alone. And if the trend continues, by mid-1980s, the buyer of a typical General Motors car will be paying an additional $800 for fuel economy, safety, and emission regulations, and that's in today's dollars. Now, we recognize the need for government regulation in some areas. Emission control and safety are typical examples. GM is, is deeply concerned about the effects of excessive costly regulations. Further regulations which do not provide commensurate consumer value will result in unnecessarily high consumer prices and continued inflationary pressures on our economy. We must never forget that our goal has always been and must continue to be to design our products for the customer. And that includes products to serve a variety of individual, family, and commercial needs. But the customer needs are constantly changing now. Let's go back a little bit to, to 1961. In 1959 and 60, we felt that maybe our fuel economy wasn't as good as it should be and that we should conserve more fuel. As a result, we took 200 pounds out of our heavier large cars. We introduced a brand new four-cylinder engine. We introduced a small V6 and even a couple of uh, aluminum small V8s. But by 1965, the customer, the customer decided that he didn't want that kind of a vehicle. He wanted a big V8. And to meet the demand, we had to build big V8s in the aisles in our plants. As a result, we sold or eliminated the smaller engines from our line. In fact, the, uh, the four-cylinder went to Mexico, and we sold to uh, outside manufacturers the other small engines. And that continued on until now. So the customer is the person we have to satisfy if we want to stay in business. Now. The demand is really on for fuel-efficient cars. The customer wants them, and General Motors is out in front and meeting those needs. Now, that's how our market changes from time to time, and we do our best to respond to those changes. Now, let me assure you that we're going to continue to build automobiles that people want and like and are good-looking. And we're going to accomplish all of this while still meeting all government regulations, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. The important point is that you can make our job a little bit easier if you can help us convince government officials to take a more reasonable approach to future regulations and consider those things that they require in order to accomplish their objectives. Let's get the necessary jobs done, of course, but let's do it in the most cost-effective, health-effective manner possible in the interests of our customers and the nation as a whole. Now, in the next few minutes, 
You'll see and hear the facts about General Motors' progress in the areas of automotive fuel economy, emissions, and safety. I hope you'll consider this information informing your own views on these critical issues. Then I hope you'll take the next step. Make your views known not only to your friends and your co-workers, but to federal, state, and local officials who enact these laws and regulations, which affect so much of our lives and our business. These laws and regulations will continue to influence, for better or worse, the future of all of us who work for General Motors and its dealers. As citizens, each of us has an obligation to our business and to ourselves to be sure that our opinions are considered. Our future is way too important to relegate to others by default. What is the most serious problem facing our nation today? Ask a thousand Americans and you'll get hundreds of different answers. Inflation, foreign competition, poverty, unemployment, urban decay. But for many people, it's likely you get one answer, energy. Because of its direct impact on so many Americans, the energy problem frequently is thought of in terms of price and availability of gasoline. So it's in the national interest, as well as in our corporate interest, that General Motors has been devoting extensive efforts and resources to conserving energy. Not only in our products, but also in the plants which produce them. These efforts have been tremendously successful. GM's automobiles for 1980 are concrete evidence of that success. In 1974, the typical GM passenger car weighed in at about 4,500 pounds and averaged 12 miles per gallon. Since those 1974 models were designed, GM has undertaken the most comprehensive redesign program in the industry's history. In that period, GM has invested an average $3.4 billion per year to meet customer and government demands. And our expenditure will be higher in the next few years, projected at well over $6 billion annually. Here is the most recent results of those efforts. The weight of the average 1980 GM automobile is about 800 pounds lighter than the average 1974 model. And GM's 1980 fleet average fuel economy is expected to be 21.4 miles per gallon, a 78% improvement over 1974. That's more than a two mile per gallon improvement over the 1979 GM fleet and it's more than a mile per gallon above the 1980 federal fuel economy standard. General Motors today is two years ahead of domestic competition in providing the kinds of vehicles our customers want. And we plan to stay ahead in the 80s when the fuel economy standards become increasingly stringent. As difficult and expensive as it will be to meet the government required 27 and a half mile per gallon fleet average for 1985, GM will make every effort to exceed that figure. Fuel economy will remain a priority consideration for car buyers in the future, and GM will continue to lead the way in meeting this and other important needs of our customers. Our job is made more difficult because we have to be sure that our products not only meet government standards, but also satisfy the diverse needs of American car buyers. As Pete Estes said, we are confident of our ability to meet future customer demands, and we are investing the necessary resources to achieve this important goal. GM's fuel economy improvements from 1975 to 1980 translate to a savings of nearly two billion barrels of gasoline during the life of these cars. That's more than three-fourths of all of the fuel consumed last year by all of the cars on all of the American highways. But as large a saving as that may be, it must be kept in perspective. 
Passenger cars today account for only about 13% of all of the energy and 28% of the petroleum used in the United States. If all the cars in the country were taken off the highways tomorrow, the United States still would have to import more than four million barrels of crude oil every day. So there's no question that it's important to save every drop of fuel we can because the energy crisis is real. Remember though, it's a crisis of petroleum-based fuels, not an energy shortage. There's more than enough energy in the world and nowhere is that more true than here in the United States, which is the richest nation in the world in fossil resources. For example, assume this one quart can represents our known domestic petroleum resources. The worldwide resources, by comparison, would fill this five gallon can. But we would need a 42 gallon barrel to represent our nation's coal resources in terms of petroleum equivalents. And two of those barrels would be needed to show our estimated shale oil resources. These supplies, if used, are sufficient to meet the needs of the United States for hundreds of years, and they can be used. Virtually all the kinds of fuel we now derive from oil also can be derived from shale, and coal can be converted to gasoline, diesel fuel, and methanol. The real barrier to taking full advantage of these resources is not entirely technical. It's basically economic and political. It will take seven to 10 years to perfect the technology and build the facilities necessary to turn oil, shale, and coal into usable liquid fuels. So it's important to begin today and to begin the development in a proper manner without permanently scarring the landscape or polluting the atmosphere. But we can't afford to passively wait for development of these sources. To buy time over the next decade, we must expand GM energy conservation programs and also our efforts to make our automobiles even more fuel efficient with technology playing a major role. A new wind tunnel at the GM Technical Center, for example, will provide the information we need to continually improve the aerodynamics of GM vehicles will increase the use of lighter weight materials such as plastics and aluminum. And will continue to develop methods of reducing the size and weight of vehicle components. By the mid 1980s, many more GM cars will be transverse engine front wheel drive models. The same design that has been so tremendously popular in the 1980 X car. There will be expanded use of turbochargers which provide large engine performance in smaller engines. We hope to make wider use of the diesel engines in passenger cars, which results in fuel economy improvement of over 25%. There are, though, environmental questions which still need to be resolved, specifically with regard to diesel particulates. While there is no scientific evidence of any potentially harmful effects, GM and the government are continuing to study the question. We also expect to have electric vehicles for some short distance driving applications. General Motors has made major advances in battery technology, which could lead to production of delivery vans or small two seat passenger cars by the mid 1980s. With the zinc nickel oxide battery, the vehicles could reach speeds of 50 miles per hour or travel up to 100 miles before recharging and have a useful battery life of about 30,000 miles. Different engines, different fuels, different materials, or different body styles, the result will be a continuation of General Motors leadership in the fuel economy drive. We'll stay in the forefront, not because of arbitrary government regulations. We'll remain the leader in the industry because our customers demand better mileage and they expect it from GM. Now there's another area in which GM has made tremendous strides, automotive air pollution control. 
Comparing a 1980 model GM automobile with an uncontrolled 1960 model, the new car emits 96% fewer exhaust hydrocarbons, 92% less carbon monoxide, and 51% fewer oxides of nitrogen. Atmospheric levels of carbon monoxide are probably the best indicator of auto pollution, and CO has declined significantly in the atmosphere in recent years in spite of increasing car population. As new cars replace older models, the decline will be even more rapid. The key to General Motors' success in this area has been the catalytic converter. The some 30 million converters manufactured by GM since 1975 have proven durable and trouble-free in almost a trillion miles of customer service. But even more sophisticated technology will be required to meet the emission standards of the 1980s. At GM, that technology takes the form of the computer-controlled catalytic converter. We call it the C4. The system relies on a computer to precisely control the air-fuel mixture entering the engine. The result is a significant decrease in emissions and a noticeable improvement in drivability. The computer also contains a diagnostic unit which can greatly reduce the time needed to identify problems. This system is standard on all GM's 1980 models in California and we plan to install it nationwide in 1981. The significant aspect of the automotive air pollution problem is this. From a technical point of view, we virtually won the battle. But we have a serious economic problem. Again, a matter of cost benefits. The question is, how much are we willing to pay to further reduce automobile air pollution from its already minimal level? In GM's view, the government must weigh the cost of additional emissions technology against the resulting benefits. There's another area of automotive regulation in which costs and benefits are somewhat more difficult to identify, driver and passenger safety. Overall, improvements in automobiles, driving habits, and highways have combined to reduce the automotive fatality rate by about 40% in the last 10 years. And safety experts agree that the rate would be reduced even further if motorists could be convinced of a simple fact. With today's technology, passive restraints mean either automatic safety belts or inflatable restraints, properly known as air cushions, which operate without any action by occupants. The automatic belt, which moves into place automatically when the door is closed, is certainly the least expensive alternative. More importantly, all our data show that the lap shoulder belts offer more protection than the more expensive inflatable devices when all types of accidents are considered. Unless a lap belt is used with the inflatable restraint, then it's not really passive. Automatic belts also present a problem in six passenger cars. We don't yet know how to provide an automatic belt for the center passenger in the front seat. GM offered a passive shoulder belt option on the Chevette last year at a list price of $50. Fewer than 10,000 customers ordered this option. We have an improved system on the 1980 Chevette, which we hope will be more popular with our customers. We are continuing our extensive development programs to design better passive restraint systems and hope to have a full front seat inflatable restraining system for the 1982 model year. It is important to emphasize that at the present state of technology, lap and shoulder belts are the best restraint system yet devised. And the most cost. I think you'll agree, what you've just seen is an impressive record of accomplishment. 
It's a record which has taken billions of dollars and the dedicated efforts of thousands of people to achieve. It's solid evidence of the contributions made by GM towards solving some of the very important problems of our society. It should be a source of great pride and confidence to every GMC truck dealer and all of their employees. GMC Truck has been a leader in its efforts to provide your customers with a fuel-efficient vehicle that can save fuel and money and still maintain good highway performance. GMC offers a variety of fuel-efficient heavy-duty trucks, Astro, Brigadier, and General. These trucks feature equipment and components that assist in providing economical operation, including high-torque rise diesel engines, driveline components, hydraulic cooling fans, radial tires, and drag foilers designed specifically for GMC trucks. Fleets and owner-operators have realized a significant percentage of fuel savings when these component combinations are teamed together to provide a truck that saves fuel and money and maintains good highway performance. The demand in the medium-duty truck industry for greater economy, fuel efficiency, and engine durability has seen a dramatic shift towards diesel power. GMC has answered the call with three new mid-range diesel engine offerings. The Detroit Diesel 8.2 liter, Caterpillar 3208, and the Cummins VT225. The mid-range GMC diesel offerings provide your customers with a logical alternative in an energy and cost conscious market. The GMC light duty product offerings have received positive improvements for increased economy and fuel efficiency. Sheet metal aerodynamics have been improved for better fuel economy. Engine and exhaust refinements have improved performance and economy. Extended availability of radial tires and numerically lower axle ratios have improved fuel economy. A part-time transfer case on four-wheel drive models is now standard. GMC offers your customers a great line of fuel and performance efficient, light, medium, and heavy-duty trucks. In view of these accomplishments by GM and the car and truck industry, it's pretty difficult to understand some of the comments you read in the newspapers and magazines and hear on radio and television. You've all heard them, I'm sure. The car and truck industry is dragging its feet. It won't do anything unless the government requires it. American vehicle manufacturers are forcing vehicles on the public that the public doesn't want. The American manufacturers' cars and trucks are gas-guzzling, dirty, and unsafe. The really unfortunate aspect of comments like that is that too many of them come from Washington and the state capitals, from the people who write the laws and regulations which have become so costly to all of us. These people would know better if only they would look at the record. There is, of course, a remedy. The remedy is the expressed opinions of General Motors and its employees, of GM dealers and their employees, GM stockholders, and everyone who shares the burden of unnecessary, costly government regulation. But your opinions can count only if you express them to those in a position to reduce the flow of government regulations. I hope the facts you've seen in this program will provide the background you need to do that. Of course, I hope you agree with GM's views, but whether you agree or disagree, the important point is to add your views to those which must be considered in any decisions of our government. General Motors has been extremely active in presenting its views to government officials. We'll continue to do so because it's so critical to the success of our business and yours. More unwarranted, unnecessary regulation of the industry will undoubtedly lead to higher costs and higher customer prices. Ultimately, cars and trucks may be priced out of the reach of some Americans. If a new car or truck is too expensive, many customers will either keep their older cars or trucks or buy a used model. Either decision would lead to reduced new car and truck sales and reduced employment throughout the industry. I urge you to write or talk personally with your elected officials, whether at the local, state, or federal level. 
Let them know what's important to you. We must reverse the trend of government regulation, and we can. I urge each of you to take part in the effort. It's too important to ignore.